Greetings, I'm Ed Steinfeld, Director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Welcome to our inaugural Kennedy Talks event on threats to the First Amendment, social media, political vitriol, and a presidential impeachment. This event is part of the Watson Institute and Brown Arts Initiative's John F. Kennedy Jr. Initiative on Documentary Film and Social Progress. The initiative seeks to celebrate John Kennedy Jr.'s dedication to the arts and really even more precisely, his professional interest in exploring how the arts and culture and multimedia, including film, can be used to bring coverage of political affairs to broad audiences. To date, we've had a number of events focusing on specific documentary films, great events. But today, uh, in the first of our Kennedy Talks, we'll explore how the intersection of social media and news coverage and entertainment and politics are, are posing a number of dilemmas and challenges with respect to freedom of speech. We're so fortunate today to be able to do this through a conversation between two very special guests, Christiane Amanpour and Martin Garbus. Martin Garbus is a renowned trial lawyer and authority on the First Amendment. He's appeared before the US Supreme Court as well as trial and appellate courts all across the United States. He served as an international election observer, including in Nicaragua and Venezuela as a representative of President Jimmy Carter. And he's received numerous awards for his international human rights and, and free speech work, having defended people not just in the US, of course, but also in China and Russia and Czechoslovakia, India, South Africa, among a number of other countries. Uh, Martin Garbus is the 2012 recipient of the Senator William Fulbright Award for Global Leadership in International Law. Christiane Amanpour is CNN's chief international anchor and host of the network's flagship global affairs program, Amanpour. She's also the host of Amanpour and Company on PBS. Since joining CNN in 1983, Christiane has covered really the most momentous events of our time, including the Iran-Iraq war, the democratic revolutions that swept Eastern Europe in the late 1980s, the Persian Gulf War, the siege of Sarajevo, Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, and so many others. She's received virtually every major broadcasting award, including 14 news and documentary Emmys, four Peabody Awards, two George Polk Awards, three DuPont Columbia Awards, and the Courage and Journalism Award, and also 10 honorary degrees. Um, our guests today will have a conversation for about 20 or 25 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to all of you in the audience to ask questions. Um, it would be great if those of you in the, in the audience use the Q&A window and you can just type in your questions and, and I will read those and give them to Christiane and Martin. You can ask, of course, you're encouraged to ask about the specific topic that they're discussion, discussing, but if you're questions want to range a little farther field, that's perfectly okay too. We want to make this as interactive as possible. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you both, Christiane and Martin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm unmuting and trying to get together with the tech of a Zoom conference here. Um, let me just say that thank you for inviting me. And I am seriously thrilled and honored to be taking part in this first event that's under the auspices of my good friend, John F. Kennedy, and his commitment to democracy, to politics and society, and the intersection of how it affects all of us. I wanna say also a great big thank you to Randall Poster, who's got this all together and who organized for me to, to be part of this event. And thank you to Martin Garbus, the distinguished First Amendment lawyer. And I will, I'm gonna take it away, Martin. Um, you're not one of my usual victims, but let's talk about something that matters very much to all of us. And to be honest with you, not just in politics, but also on campus. I mean, I think you know better than I, and so do the Brown audience, uh, that free speech and the limits of speech are hugely important and very controversial, in fact, right now on so many campuses. So Martin, let me first ask you, because I remember when I was a student at the University of Rhode Island, one of my first journalism classes in the matter of free speech was about the 1978 case of Skokie, Illinois, when a neo-Nazi group wanted to march through that village or town um, close to Chicago. And the ACLU argued that it should happen. And it was very, very controversial. I myself was shocked that a neo-Nazi group was allowed to publicly display itself and all its hatred um, in the United States of America. I was an immigrant, I was a new arrival to the United States. 
I came from Iran where we did not have free speech. And beyond that, I'd learned about World War II and I was really shocked. So I wanna ask you first, because I know you've defended a lot of controversial speech, what you made of that and what you would do differently, if anything, today. I represented people like the people at Skokie. Uh, I would do that differently today. I think uh, I was brought up and, and to send, we were all brought up with the idea of American exceptionalism. We were brought up with the idea that the First Amendment was this extraordinarily unique thing. I think we now know a little more and we now know that words like equal protection of the law or the First Amendment are applied on behalf of some groups and not others. I mean, we watched the testimony today uh, with respect to the break-in at the Capitol. We know that uh, if the group were a Black Lives Movement group breaking in, that there would have been a much faster, at least my view of it, a much faster reaction from the people in power. So I think that the idea that the First Amendment, and to me years ago, it was like a religion. Uh, I think that the idea that the First Amendment is something pure and survives the question of misapplication by people in power, I think we now have to accept that as wrong. And once we accept that as wrong, the question is, where do we go from there? Go ahead, Christine. Well, first let me ask you and push you on accepting that it's wrong. Um, you know, as you said, for America, the Constitution and the First Amendment is like a religion. No other country in the world has a constitution like yours, and certainly not a First Amendment that gives the right to free speech, uh, freedom of thought, freedom of assembly. We here in the UK do not have that enshrined in any constitution. And it's the one thing that anybody who comes to America or works for an American organization or is on an American campus really values. And so I think I'd like to know where are the limits that you would put if you had to rethink the idea of this kind of freedom? Because we, we, we remember, I mean, I remember from my classes that you, know, you, don't, you don't scream fire in a crowded cinema. That was, I think, a Supreme Court justice who said that. And there, there was a sense of there are limits. Where would you put the limits on speech right now? First of all, let, let, let me say this, that the whole American commitment to free speech did not come, especially from the Constitution. It came much later in the 20th century as a result of some cases. There's an extraordinary book by a journalist, Ellis Coes, called The Short Life and Curious Death of Free Speech in America. So it, it really is something that starts more, more or less in, in the 30s and 40s. It really, you didn't have free speech cases and all that stuff before that period of time. Having said that, I think that we are all much more aware, whether it be because of Bush against Gore or whether because of some of the carrying on with, with Donald Trump, uh, how the law can be used unfairly and unequally. We have always talked about equal justice of the law rather than equitable justice of the law. So whether or not, you know, with respect to Nazis who I defended, with respect to racists who I defended, I think that this country is now in a very different place. Without looking back as to whether I or people like me were right or wrong, I think there has to be a different analysis now. Putting it into words and saying that this Supreme Court test or rather that Supreme Court test is better or worse is very difficult. But I think the first thing to do is the cultural problem, the recognition that the First Amendment, like anything else, in other words, we were brought up that anyone who wants to vote can vote. We were brought up on the idea that people were not thrown in jail wrongfully. We were brought up on the idea, a lot of ideas that, that we now know, or many of us have known for a long time. I think that looking at the First Amendment is another idea that many of us were brought up with the wrong idea. We didn't, and, and today, for example, when you put together the First Amendment, 
with the with the question of money and with the question of power and you look at the fact that if 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 Skokie would happen tomorrow maybe the american government can stop something a riot from happening in Skokie or Charlottesville but they can't stop if it's on facebook that triggering some event in australia or austria so i think you have to look at the, the, the fact that it has to be treated differently in America. It has to be treated with the recognition that the First Amendment is applied basically in one way on behalf of people in power and another way in people who don't have power. Mm -hmm. And it gets rid of the idea in a way. Somehow we deluded ourselves in America about the exceptionalism and purity of the First Amendment. I don't, I thought that for a long time, I no longer do. And yet I will say that people all over the world who are struggling under their authoritarian governments, under their dictatorships, under their military hunters, really want what you have in America, which is the freedom to speak. So let's just deconstruct some of what you've, what you've just said. First and foremost, why did you defend racists and Nazis? What particular cases and what caused you to do that? The idea that I grew up with were the words of Brandeis and Holmes. And their idea was that if you had bad speech, you would have good speech that would take it over. And that the good speech would have to be triggered by the bad speech and that that would be good for the culture. And that was basically the idea of the people who developed the broadness of American protections for the First Amendment. I think that hasn't been true for a while. And I think that the Trump period and the use of money uh, shows that it's not true now and won't be true for, excuse me, go ahead. Christian. No, no, carry on. I, 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 I'm just sort of trying to make a barrier between money and power. Maybe the two are- Oh, I don't, I don't know that you easily can. Maybe you can't, you're right. But I think one of the things you said, which I want to again pick up on, was that at that time, there was the idea that everybody de deserved a defense, that free speech, if it was bad, would be able to be counteracted, maybe even drowned out by good. Of course, that's all also um, uh, subjective, isn't it? Depending on who's thinking. But I think what you're saying now is that social media has exponentially driven false, violent, hate speech, as well as everything else, but certainly that, into a stratospheric situation which we're finding very hard to control and rein in, and therefore might need some extra regulation. Is that what you're saying? You have said it beautifully, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure people all agree with us, and I think it would be interesting. No, it's not a question of agreeing. You've stated the issue beautifully. And is that what you agree with? Is that what you're yes. saying? Yes. In other words, so yes. The next question. Mm -hmm. go, yeah, no, go ahead, Christian. No. The next question is how? And I guess let's just talk about a country, maybe two countries that we know have had to deal with this in the 20th century on a real life basis. One country is post-Nazi Germany after the war, after being rebuilt with the help of the United States, the Marshall Program, the Marshall Plan. The Germans, I mean, it's nothing short of heroic what they did to rebuild their shattered and violent and hateful past into one of the strongest democracies in the world that they strongly believe in. One of the other countries that I covered, obviously there was Bosnia, which was all about hate speech, which which completely and utterly accelerated the genocide there, but on an even bigger scale, Rwanda, which I also covered, in which hate speech on radio um, generated and fueled and led to the frenzied killing of nearly a million people by machetes and clubs in the space of under three months. So we've had international courts that have legislated or rather have, have, have ruled um, that that was you know, a crime against humanity, a war crime, and those who have been guilty have been, um, have been convicted and sentenced. Um, and their countries have tried to emerge in a way that regulates speech. Germany is doing it right now, Professor Garbus. They are now potentially looking into the group AFD, uh, Alternative for, for Deutschland. 
They are the single largest political group outside of the governing coalition, and they are notoriously anti-immigrant, anti-Islamic, and some would describe them as having neo-Nazi and neo-fascist tendencies. The intelligence community there is considering surveilling them and keeping them on a short leash. And that's a matter of big debate in Germany. So these are real live, non-theoretical issues. How would you do it in the United States, Martin Garbus? Well, first of all, I, I think your reference to Germany today is wonderful because Germany, we know what Germany was. We know that for a period of time, because of Merkel and others, Germany became something different. We now see in Germany, in France, the extraordinary reemergence more uh, uh, of, of the right wing. And we see the same things being said now that was said, many of the same things that were being said prior to World War II and during World War II. So what we see is in a way is a bend. Uh, I don't wanna get into Martin Luther King's bend for justice because I don't think that's there, certainly not in this instance. Uh, but I think that the places that you have mentioned, I was in Rwanda as you were, uh, and we saw what hate speech can do. Uh, and we, in a way, try, I think there's a difference between hate speech and incendiary speech. Mm -hmm. It's one thing, leading the United States Supreme Court case, Brandenburg, 1969, a man is, is saying horrific things, but he's saying it for TV cameras and he and his friends are burning crosses, the Ku Klux Klan. There's nobody there being incited to violence. So the Supreme Court in that case comes up with a test with respect to incitement to violence and in Charlottesville, incitement to violence. And more or less, you expect the police to enforce that. We now know, I mean, the, the, the riot and the insurrection makes it clear, if we didn't know it before, that there are many law enforcement people like many other people who have a hostility to certain groups having the same rights of free speech as others. We now, I think, have come to the point where we have to recognize that free speech, like anything else, is unequally, unequally applied. Mm -hmm. That instead of the words equitable, in other words, there should be an equitable application. I, I can see justifying, for example, some kind of free speech that I might find to transgressive in race, where I would not justify that same kind of speech on behalf of Nazis or, or Holocaust conversation. Namely, I think that free speech can be used in a way to redress imbalances. And to do that, and I don't want to get into words like reparations and things like that, but I think that one has to start to recognize that in the same way that we are saying looking at this American society, race, the history of race. And in other words, our constitution, why does it not guarantee, for example, housing? Why does it not guarantee equal wages? Why is it that it guarantees speech? And I think to some extent, the, the founders of the constitution had all those benefits uh, and uh, they were not concerned about making sure they were equally applied. So I think through free speech in a way, you can look at the entire constitution, you can look at the Amer entire American structure of law so that you have this wonderful, seemingly fair, um, aesthetic, and it's being wrongfully applied. And, and your next question is, okay, if, if I agree with that, what do we then do? And how do we then deal with it? And that's where, and, and that's that's the issue that, that we have to deal with. First, you have to accept the proposition that I'm putting out. And the next thing you have to say is, if you're right, Marty, or if I agree with you, how do we then deal with it? And I think that's a complicated issue. Well, it is a complicated issue and there's a lot of strands to it because not all of it is, is literally speech. Some of it is very much, I mean, as you say, infrastructure and the, equitable distribution of rights to all Americans, because we're talking about the United States at the moment, and that clearly is not the case. I wonder whether in the future, 
journalism classes, the Trump administration will be a test case for all sorts of reasons. The assault on the democratic process in terms of questioning the legality of the election, um, in terms of trying to stop the count, um, then obviously leading to the insurrection. I think it'll be a really interesting test case. Um, let me just give you a couple of, of, of facts. You know, the Washington Post did a, a really phenomenal job throughout the Trump administration of, um, of counting and fact-checking the falsities. Now, I can't find the exact figure here, but it was definitely more than 35,000, 35,000 actual lies, misinformation or disinformation that came from the president himself. And we saw once the system didn't, let's say, stand up for itself and it didn't drop the mic and it did keep allowing this free speech from the White House, we saw the violence and the insurrection, as you said, on January 6th. And thereafter, or around that time, Twitter removed Donald Trump. That is an absolute action from a moneyed technology company. And big tech is one of the reasons why we're having this hugely exponentially difficult issue on, free, on hate speech and the like. And there are a lot of people who didn't like what Jack Dorsey did. And, and yet, we live now in a world for the time being that does not react every two seconds to a Trump tweet. And you can feel a qualitative difference with not having to fact check every single tweet that comes out of, of the White House. What do you think, Martin? Do you think that that was the right thing to do by Jack Dorsey? I mean, some people say it violates the First Amendment and the protection against uh, you know, the protection for free speech. I think many of us felt that Facebook, Google, Twitter uh, should not be restricted in what they said. Uh, we never anticipated that they would become as powerful as they were. I don't think any of us understood, Trump understood it, that if you tell a lie and repeat it 74 times, it becomes the truth. And the question is, as we go forward, how do you deal with that? So I'm in favor of taking away from Facebook, Google, Twitter, the protections they once had by saying, no, no, they were like the news media and therefore they couldn't be sued. No, they should be as responsible as more responsible. You can't compare their responsibility with the Washington Post and other people. So I'm very much in favor of taking away the protections they previously had. There's a particular provision that's being debated, section 230, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that it's consistent with what I believe about speech, that those people who have this enormous money and this enormous power and can repeat lies endlessly until the lies become the truth something that Steve Bannon understood, something that Donald Trump understood, that that has to be stopped somehow. And one of the ways is making the irresponsible, the media, whether it be CNN or anybody else, more responsible. Now, the dangers of that are extraordinary. The dangers of that are that by and large, the people that I'm sympathetic to have less power and less money so that people who articulate things that I believe are true can be wiped out by extraordinary sums of money. If you look at the lawsuits that are now being filed against Trump through Dominion, through the biting and the pillow and all that stuff, one can say, oh, that's terrific. There's an extraordinary danger though in having all that money and power being able to suppress speech because my speech, the people that I agree with will have their speech suppressed. You know, this is a moment in time. And the question is, as you go tomorrow, how do you deal with the question of a lie told a thousand times becomes the truth? And how do you balance that? And the, you know, when we did the constitution, you're talking about before Brandeis homes, they didn't have this, they, well, of course. Uh, they could, no one could foresee uh, uh, money, power, the media, lies becoming truth. I mean, I don't want to go back to Germany and all that stuff. Joseph Goebbels, 
you know, at any time those images come up, I really want to get out of the conversation. But his statement that a, a little lie constantly told becomes true. And that's happened to you. Yeah, I, I actually think it's important that we remember history. And that history, as I say, I, I as a, an innocent abroad, saw it, uh, you know, reveal itself to me in the Balkans, in the former Yugoslavia, in yes. Bosnia, yes. not very long after, you know, yes. after the Nazis. It was the first such mm -hmm. event in Europe after World War II. Yes. And it, most definitely a lot of it was powered by, by, by lies, disinformation, demonization, and using the media to, uh, to support their, their, their genocide. First, it was called ethnic cleansing. Um, I, I want to ask you, Martin, because perhaps um, the students or those who are watching will be interested in this. It's something I saw in a recent documentary, and it's this struggle that we have with trying to figure out where the line is. Where do you draw the line? How do you, um, quote unquote, police um, the, the, the speech space? And, you know, whose truth is more valid than, 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 than the other person's? And I was struck by something I hadn't known at the time. And they took as a case study, uh, Senator Joe McCarthy and his red baiting and all that terrible stuff um, that was going on in the United States in the 50s. And it took two sets of media executives to shut him down. And I found, and I, I'd love you to, if, if, if you recall, you know, the details of it, they, they basically said it was, I think it was the Denver Post and it was the great Edward R. Morrow of CBS. And, jo and Joseph Welch. And Joseph Welch, I, I hadn't remembered that. Um, but they, well, Edward R. Morrow obviously on yes. CBS picked him apart lie by lie, Joe McCarthy, who was saying to, that every Tom, Dick and Harry was a, was a communist and ruining people's lives. But they also said, I think they forced the Senate to say that you had to have a, a basic standard of fact when you speak, when you speak that meets some kind of public definition of the truth that, that would be admissible in court. And when they realized that McCarthy wasn't doing that, the, the networks took a, and, the, and the big newspapers took a decision. And when he was denied the oxygen of the press, he became much less powerful. And eventually, as we know, you know, his whole house of cards cr crumbled. But that's a real life case of how to do it. That was a long time ago. Uh, I think you're dealing with more complex issues today. There was fairly easy to draw a line, communist, anti-communist, speech, not speech. Also, the people being prosecuted under the McCarthy period were by and large a certain group of people. Uh, uh, they had their own, I don't want to go beyond this, some degree of privilege. Many of them were started out with, as we know, so that they were prominent here or there. Uh, I think today it's very, very different. I think that, I think that, that what happened with the protests of the Black Lives Movement has to be recognized. One thing I don't know, as we watch today, we know that the riot occurs in part because Trump enjoyed it. We know in part because many of the police in protecting the Capitol had sympath sympathies for the, for the people who were doing the demonstration. We know a whole host of things. We know that information was withheld from the Capitol Police. And whether I don't believe today's version of the facts, namely, that they just didn't get the information. I don't believe that. I believe it was withheld and maybe that'll come out in future stories. But given the control that people in power have over speech and truth, it was, we never understood that. We never, we, e even in the McCarthy period, we understood it somewhat, but, but the, after all the McCarthy period was picking out a certain small select group of people and it was very easy to tar them with this brush, Stalinism. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is a different time. And, and No, I know, I hear you. My, my point was more that actually there were members of the, of the institutions like us, the Fourth, fourth yes. State. Yes. We said, no, enough. Drop the mic. Do not give him airtime if he's going to continue to lie. And we will only give him airtime if he demonstrates at least some kind of loyalty to rationality, reality, and the truth. 
But this is a good place, Martin, because we have now spent uh, half an hour and we've got half an hour left of this uh, event. And um, we agreed, and Edward's back now, to get us some questions from, from the students and the audience. Super, thanks to you both for kicking off such a great conversation. We're going to begin with a few students who are gonna ask questions uh, themselves uh, on air, so to speak. And then I'll turn to the questions that have been streaming in in the Q&A window. And those of you who still have questions, please keep on asking. We have, we have time to get to a bunch. So let's start with a question from Dana Kurniawan. Dana? Hi there, I hope you can hear me. Thank you so much for having this event. It's really, really informative. Um, I'm, I'm an environmental studies and computer science junior at Brown. And I really want to ask, I, you both brought up, you know, just like the state of the media and what that has sort of morphed into, especially social media sort of contradicting the integrity of basic facts. Um, but, you know, both an arguably divisive and unifying truth remains, which is just the threats to our environment, both observed and unobserved. Um, considering the entrenched powers of fossil fuel companies, as well as, you know, in the Chevron versus Don's education, case and many other cases, just from both your careers as a question to both of you, what do you think is the role of law and media in urgently combating climate change, maybe especially in the context of this new administration? Thank you. Christine. Okay, I'll go first. Um, this is what I think about climate. In much the same way as so many issues have mistakenly been taken as on the one hand, on the other hand, in the mistaken view that that's objective and truthful, it is not. It's created a false equivalence, which means it's created a lie, which means it has tried to say that the actual science about climate is equal somehow to the minuscule number of deniers around the world. And the press, sadly, not to mention the special interests, of course, and governments who are financed by the special interests and the fossil fuel industries, but the press has fallen into that trap. So for all these years where we could have been charging forth by telling the truth on climate, and therefore actually you know, using our free speech platform, we mistakenly did not, thinking that we had to give both sides equal time. This is a huge, huge issue, and uh, we have a lot of catching up to do. So I think the press has a huge amount of work to do on this issue, but on many other issues that, that fall into this trap of this false factual or moral equivalence. Let, let me answer. Uh, the, 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 the questioner uh, referred to the Donziger case. Uh, I happen to be one of his lawyers. And in that particular case, Chevron has spent tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars in order to break a critic of the oil and gas industry. And you have very profound questions of free speech in that case in that case, equal justification. He's now facing a criminal trial, which comes up in three months. And it's the use of money. By the way, of course, Trump had substantial investments in the oil and gas industry, as did Rudy Giuliani, as did Bill Barr. In that particular case, I don't want to get into the, 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 the nitty gritty of it. The US attorney refused to prosecute Donziger. The oil and gas industry then got a judge to appoint a private prosecutor, a very rare thing. The private prosecutor working under this, the, the title of the American government, he is a US prosecutor, is someone who previously represented Chevron. <clears throat> and it's a law firm, it's a powerful lobbyist for Chevron and Exxon. So, with, I mean, in a way, with, with the question you've just done, You've gotten into the heart of the question of money and power. The amount of money that Chevron and Exxon are going to spend, along with the people who supported them, Trump, Barr, Giuliani, et cetera, is going to outweigh the, Amazon, the, the, the uh, amnesties or the green pieces or whatever. So you are never going to have because of economic power, the ability to match them dollar for dollar. And in a society where dollar for dollar counts, how do you do it? I mean, Donziger is a guy who got broken. It, he, he would not say got broken in half. He got badly beat up and is getting beat up because the extraordinary amount of money that Chevron has put in. In short, he got a judgment for $50 billion in Ecuador on behalf of people who were harmed 
by Chevron and predecessor companies and uh, uh, the, the full force of the economic interests of, of Chevron has come down against him. So how do you compete? How does somebody get up and compete and say something against Chevron, which has untold billions to put into this struggle? And they did and they will. So how can you talk about free speech as being an equal thing when there is such unequal power applying it? Thank you. Uh, let's turn to a question from Hannah Ponce. Hi, thank you for joining us today. Um, this is Amanpour and Mr. Garbus. It has been an honor to be here and learn from you both. Um, it's been a very informative session. And uh, as we've discussed in the past half hour, social media is obviously a very powerful yet dangerous tool for the widespread dissemination of information and ideas. And um, as we have discussed again, and we've seen in the past election year, this power is demonstrated by its ability to instantly share information within and influence the marketplace for ideas. Yet the danger is also demonstrated in how this instantaneous um, marketplace of ideas leads to disinformation, increased polarization, and violence. Uh, accounting for the manner in which social media has been adopted as a major source of news and information for nearly every generation of US citizens today, how can we navigate the First Amendment and free speech protections in this age of disinformation? I'll just answer it briefly and then maybe Christian. I think you use the term that the United States Supreme Court justices used years ago, marketplace of ideas. And the idea was that you would have ideas in a marketplace and everybody had an equal voice and articula in articulating it. We know now that that's totally untrue. It's been made so clear by the Trump people and by money, whether it be Murdoch or whatever you can. So the whole American concept based on the free marketplace of ideas has proven to be in a way, you can say it's not something that's gonna guarantee equality, nor is it gonna guarantee equal access to the media. And, um, I think that's a very profound question. I, 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 with, with great courage, I'll, I'll defer to Christian. <laughs> great courage, I will try to answer the question. This is what I'm gonna to say to people. People, you have a responsibility. You are all educated. You are all worldly. You have untold resources at your fingertips, all of those, and I'm talking about intellectual resources, books, libraries, online, archives. Anywhere you go, you can access the truth wherever it is. It is not okay for people anymore to slough off their responsibility. We have seen now for many, many years that the great stuff that the internet promised and the social media delivered has been more than balanced by the nefarious, by the conspiracies, by the disinformation, by the dark web. And we've got to figure out how we can re, uh, re-own the truth. And there are ways of doing it. I think all schools should teach social media literacy. They should tell young kids from the beginning of time how to go places and how to recognize what's untrue and where to go to find truth. Now, some people might say, oh, there's no such thing as truth. Well, there is, and there are, is such a thing as facts. And you can find them at the the tried and true and tested brands, whether it be the New York Times or this or that or CNN or whatever it is, or universities, you know, museums, archives, libraries, you can find the truth. You can even just cross check and fact check with your neighbors and your friends and your families. There is no excuse other than a willing disregard for looking for the truth to fall into conspiracy theories and into the dark, dark holes and say, oh, I didn't know any better. I really believe that it's a lot on us right now. And then I believe that the social media giants, the tech giants need to be regulated. Sorry, if we in the press have to abide by the rules of the road, why are they not bound by the same rules of the road when they want to drive the same road as we drive without wearing their seatbelts? I mean, it's just not okay. 
And in real life and in the real world, this has massive impact, even beyond the United States. And you saw the horrors that came over the last four years of conspiracy theories, dark webs, this, that, and the other. You saw what happened. Not to mention life and death and in the number of people who died of COVID because we were told it was a hoax, right? That's social media and powerful people taking it on. But in places like Myanmar or the Philippines or India and many of the places that I cover, social media is their news. They barely have any you know, independent news organizations. So it's all on Facebook or on this or on that. And therefore they're utterly susceptible to what happens. Uh, so I really do think that um, absent any regulation or any sort of recalibration of this world that we've got ourselves into, it's on each and every individual to protect themselves, to take the precautions needed to filter out that stuff and to look for and stay in the lane of fact and science and information that you can verify. Super, thank you. Let's turn to a question from Finn Loudon. Christiane, you, you, you should become a First Amendment lawyer. I mean, you've been in the wrong field for too long. Really. Great, Finn, why don't you go ahead? Hello. Um, I just wanted to echo my peers and thank you both so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And um, my name is Finn and I'm a junior at Brown concentrating in economics and public policy. But I've recently grown inter interested in the intersection of those two fields with cybersecurity and ethics, which is where my question comes from today. Specifically, what responsibility, if any, should be borne by tech and social media companies for designing the platforms and algorithms that can facilitate this consumption of fringe media? Although intention matters, should these companies be held responsible for the potentially hazardous outcomes that their platforms can create? And if so, what specifically can be done? I would just answer yes to that. But Christiane, go ahead. I would answer what percentage, 100%. And the answer, yes, I would also answer. Um, in terms of should they be held responsible? But the more difficult question is how and what? And that does, I'm afraid, sadly it does, require not just the kind of individual determination to, to seek out the facts and the truth, um, but also uh, regulation. And there are ongoing cases. I mean, for instance, you know, Europe has done a lot better than the United States in regulating some of these uh, tech giants. Um, but again, I just keep saying, and I'd say it if they were sitting in front of me, these guys get a free pass when they go to Congress. They sit there and they bamboozle these elderly senators with all their stuff. And these people have no idea how to come back to the tech talk and they get away with it. And it's just not okay. They really need to be responsible members of society. And I believe that Twitter taking down Donald Trump was the first chink in, or the first brick in this wall of, of responsibility. Let me just give you, I mean, I was so taken by this. I believe I have responsibility, right? When I'm on CNN broadcasting to the world, whether it's interviewing a world leader, whether it's interviewing a war criminal, whether it's, you know, going to, you know, post 9-11 or in the Gulf Wars or the genocides and all those, my responsibility is to use my massive and powerful platform in order to inform and not to deceive. That I take very, very seriously. And I just think that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very easy to say we created this amazing stuff. And as Martin would say, we are really rich and powerful now and we can do whatever the heck we want. And I was just listening to this radio um, report on Robert Oppenheimer, as you remember, he corralled the US science into discovering or to, into, the, into the first nuclear weapon. And afterwards he said, he said, I have become death destroyer of worlds. He took the, I believe it was, it's a Hindu God saying, and he used it. And later in the 60s, he went to MIT and he talked about the pride of the scientific achievement that went into um, you know, Los Alamos and, the, and the, nuclear, the nuclear development and the nuclear work. But he said, scientists have known sin as well. And what he's saying is that we can, we can know it all, we can have it all, we can be as powerful as to split the atom, but it doesn't mean it's right. And it doesn't mean we just can because we can, or we should because we can. And I think when it comes to free speech and hate speech and conspiracies and all the rest of it, we have to apply that kind of sense of self-regulation, self-policing, 
uh, responsibility, and if none of that works, regulation. Well, just following up on, I think, Christine, wonderful going from Oppenheimer to today, because so many of these things are so deep seated, and I'm not going to, you ultimately have, when you come to the media, money and power. And that's a situation that is not going to dramatically change in our lifetime, if ever. So as long as you have this extraordinary imbalance between who has the money, who has the power, then you're going to have the various interpretations of truth. And the people who have the money and power, by and large, CNN, CBS, Christine, notwithstanding, they will have the last words. Even if you stop Facebook and Google, we now know that there are endless other things that are going, that are going to pop up that can't be regulated unless the society makes some commitment to looking at how money and power affects truth. I mean, that's, I, I don't mean to say, what, I, what I'm saying ain't, pro, ain't profound, but, but it, it, it's become so clear that whether it be the Murdochs or the Foxes or this or that, as long as there's this enormous reservoir of money to create lies, then you somehow have to deal with money and power and you have to recognize, as I think we do, that that defines truth and whose truth it is. The, the, right now under Trump and for many, we shouldn't put it just on Trump. You, you, you mentioned the McCarthy period, you, you know, you had many, many other things as long as the money and power controls the truth, then the truth is a variable subject to money and power. Well, there's an important court case going on right now, which is a $2.7 billion suit by, I can't remember the name of the group, but it's the-, it's the Smartomatics. Yes, yes, that makes the election uh, software or whatever against Fox News. And that will be an important test case, let me tell you. It will it's be very dangerous. These are very, you know, I, I certainly agree with Smartomatic and of course I'm hostile to Fox News, but those cases are also very dangerous because they're going to establish law, I think, that will be used against people who have less money to quash them more quickly. That's a long discussion, not for now, but, but, but I look at those cases as appropriate as going against the bad guys, but having a lot of dangers in them. Great. Let's turn to some questions uh, from the audience in the in the Q and A window. Uh, let's start with a question from Jasmine Moore, who asks, "How does the questioning of the election in 2020 differ from prior objections to election results in previous years, this millennium?" And maybe I'll just append something to that question. So, Donald Trump questioned election results. Stacey Abrams questioned election results, what, in 2018 in the Georgia gubernatorial race. How do those differ? And maybe more important and related to Jasmine's question, do we want the state and the courts to come in and make rules about how one states the truth or objects to, to election results? How would the state adjudicate between those different kinds of objections? Well, let me just say this. Let, let's not distort, in a way, Bush against Gore was not unremarkably, was different, but you also had the misuse of the legal system to achieve a questionable political result. So Trump did not invent what has happened here. Uh, the whole idea that you should stop people from voting, which we're now seeing coming back into Republican legislatures, has been with us for a very, very long time. So I think that it's a, you know, I, I think that as, as, as unique as Trump is, it's vested and it comes from American history. The struggle that Stacey Abrams went through, people have, you know, you had a first reconstruction and maybe the civil rights movement was a second reconstruction and maybe we're going through a third reconstruction now but it's not new. There's nothing new. I mean, you had during Reconstruction, as we know in America, 
a high percentage, not a high percentage, a greater percentage of blacks in political office and the media and other entities of money drove them out of office. So I think that it's, it, it's right to look at Trump today, but it's wrong to divorce it from American history. Uh, I, I would agree, you can't divorce it from American history. And I'm sitting here outside of America looking in, so my perspective might be a little bit different. Um, I, I would just say that in this case, the media did a heck of a good job. We, the established media, the derived as the mainstream media, we did a great job. We held our nerve, we told the truth, we were on the ground, we reported what was going on. Um, every challenge in, you know, after this election to every state house and, and to the Supreme Courts and all the rest of it, we reported and we would not allow a lie uh, to be so-called the big lie, as, as they called it there, um, to happen on our watch. Let, and, you know, I, 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 would take issue, I would take issue with some of that. In other words- Well, we did, Martin, Martin, you can't take issue because it happened. The truth. One, of, one of the one of the things about January sixth. I'm not talking or, about January sixth. I'm talking about from the election until January sixth. Yes, I, I, let, let, let me we let me out get. because of us, as well as because of very very strong um, Republicans, judges, election workers who refuse to allow the most powerful person in the world to exert the kind of influence that would cause them to change the results of a free, fair, and independent election. That, to me, is the silver lining and is the strength of what the whole world has just witnessed happen in the United States. And believe me, for us sitting out here, Martin, it's really important because all those banana republics and, and dictatorships and military hunters that we cover, now they have seen that no matter how much they thought they were being mollycoddled by the United States over the last four years, the truth was out, the people actually won, and that's it. Whoever they voted for, they would have, you know, they, they voted here and their vote was counted and it mattered. Yes, but uh, um, why was it that it took January 6th and the reporting in the media and the way the media was reported to understand how deeply entrenched the Proud Boys and others were. What was the extent of the media coverage? In other words, January 6th did not come from nowhere. That has been there for a long time. One of the feelings that I had, and let me say this, say it in, in, in a non-confrontational way. One of the values of January 6th was it ripped away a screen over what had been festering in the United States for a long time. So yes, CNN covered this or that. And, but the amount of coverage, there was a failure in the media because all this that had been going on had not been reported. January 6th did not arise out of nothing. The Proud Boys and these other groups had been there for a long time. And yet, the way the media reports it, or the way we think about it, is all of a sudden something happened on January 6th. Absolutely false. The media failed for years to cover a lot of it. In other words, we don't have to get into Trump 70 million or 74 million or what that means or what it doesn't mean. But January 6th did not come out of nothing. It was there. And the amount of media exposure or coverage of the stuff that Trump did was surface in large part. You know, I, I can accept a lot of that, uh, a lot of that analysis and criticism. I would just say that nor did the police know because they weren't there. You know, the government- No, 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 no wait a minute. A lot of the police- okay. You not... know what, we're gonna get off track now. There, there must be another question. I, I concede to you this point. There is actually a question from Ellis Coase, who Martin, you had uh, mentioned his book earlier, but he asked a very general question and an appropriate one. Uh, do you think that most Americans really understand what the First Amendment is? And may maybe you can, you both can explain what, how you understand what the First Amendment fundamentally is. To whom is it directed? And, and to whom is it directed against? 
let me just let Christina, why don't, why don't you do that? Well, I'm, I'm just going to do it from my perspective, but you're, you know, you're the, you're the, you know, you've studied it a lo lot longer than I have and tested it in court. I would just say that I was under the impression that the First Amendment protected ordinary citizens from the powerful. Therefore, when you talk about removing the president's First Amendment right, like some people did after, you know, Twitter uh, and Jack Dorsey, um, I think it was a little bit, you know, backwards because it, it, from what I gathered and from all my, you know, journalism courses, it, it's meant to protect ordinary citizens from the power and the money and, and all of that. Um, and then, you know, it's what everybody, you know, believes and, and knows. It's the, the freedom to be able to speak and gather and think and write and, and, uh, and, and all the rest of it. But I think it comes with it a responsibility as well. It's not, as Martin would say, an absolute religion. I, I think Ellis's wonderful book, which came out last year, which deals with this, at least the way I interpret his book, is a recognition that what is and what is not free speech has always been something that has been decided by the more powerful people at the expense of the less powerful people. And how you translate that in terms of race or leftism or rightism is an interesting question. I think Ellis's book does a wonderful job in discussing it. And I think that is now the debate, the recognition the, that that money controls the First Amendment, that its idea of this virtuous thing, pure, untouched, I think that's gone. It should be gone. It was gone. A lot of people knew it was gone in 1960, and they knew it was gone in 1880. There were groups of people like me, as I was a young law student, who thought it was, in a way, purer than it was. And I was wrong. Maybe, Martin, could I follow up? It, if the argument, or does the argument then become that the way to redress these imbalances of social power and economic power is to turn to the government or the, the state or the courts, a, a different kind of power to intervene what prevents a kind of a tyranny of political power? I Why think would we trust I, the courts or the or the? I think Congress? the way Christiana said before is, is 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 the way it has to be done. It has to be not institutions because institutions come under the control of it. It has to be, as she was saying, the education, the awareness of every citizen, and every citizen has to be responsible that the government can't do it and you shouldn't trust the government to do it. At some level in America, we said, oh, the First Amendment, we'll trust the government to do it. I think we know that we can't. And man many people have known that for a long time. So I think that what, 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 what Christiane said before was exactly on point to what you're asking now. The people have to become educated and aware and trust themselves to arrive at their judgments. And whether it be CNN or the New York Times, uh, they have to come to their own judgments. I, I mean, look, I, I would just say in defense of mainstream journalism, you know, we follow a code of ethics. We have a professional code. Most of us have been educated. We, you know, it's, it's a craft. It's not just we've been, you know, taken from, from somewhere and plonked somewhere. And, and suddenly we, we've been turned into arbiters of whatever, truth and information. Most of us have worked really, really hard to get to this point. And it's about experience, it's about learning, it's about you know, starting off in, in local news. And this is one issue that Martin, I think you know, you're right. Why, do the, why did the press miss this big story, particularly about the Proud Boys and the others? Um, a lot of it is due to the fact that local news has been decimated. So if I was to say anything to educational facilities and those with journalism schools, you know, I, 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 and again, that's about money. You're absolutely right. People are taking their money out of local news. And without local news in a country as huge as America, you are not gonna get the whole story. And when there was 
you know, healthy amounts of competing newspapers in different towns and cities and states and radio stations and television stations and all the rest of it, you had a much broader and more real and deep sense of actually what was going on. And then I would just say also that, you know, I think it was Reagan, I can't remember which president, maybe it was Reagan, who decimated the, um, the fairness doctrine and all the stuff that the Federal Communications Commission brought, certainly broadcast. And we did actually have this thing that meant that we had to, you know, be fair and a, an equal opportunity in our coverage on TV. And they thought that the marketplace of ideas would be just as good, and yet it wasn't. Because when they took that away, then we got out and out political organizations masquerading as journalistic organizations. And Fox News is number one of those. And Rush Limbo, who is no longer on this planet, was one of those who created this political, he could have been left wing or right wing, it doesn't matter. They created a political sphere, a political space and called it news, but it wasn't. And so we're suffering from that as well. So I think a combination of the extreme politicization of journalism and the lack of investment and money in local news has created a little bit of the, of the dilemma that we face right now. I think we have a very good follow on question to this conversation, a question that comes from Stephen Wallace. And Stephen directs this question to Christiane, but I, I think it's applicable to, to, to you both. Uh, Stephen writes, Christiane, you mentioned the power of news organizations and social media to shut down Trump in light of 30,000 plus lies. Is this not the easier case for intervention? What could the media have done early in the Republican presidential campaign where there were some 20 candidates to prevent the rise of Trump? Wasn't it clear that his campaign was built on lies even then and perhaps early intervention was justified? And maybe again, I'll just add, I mean, there's one explanation that the mainstream media in Trump saw a very entertaining figure who attract a lot of attention, great for business, et cetera. And, I don't know, would the fairness doctrine have addressed that? How do we work through that example that Stephen provides? Well, I think that, um, again, and I think Martin brought this up as well, it is absolutely true that nobody got the Trump story right um, during the 2015, 2016 campaign in the, in the mainstream media. They just treated him as a joke um, and that's it. You know, They did not think he was gonna win. Apparently he didn't think he was gonna win, but they didn't think he was gonna win. And so it was treated as a ratings bonanza and a bit of a joke. And everybody assumed that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And therefore, they treated Hillary uh, with the journalistic rigor that you would treat a president. And they treated Trump with the hands off kid gloves of a, you know, uh, a pretender with no hope whatsoever. And that's what happened in the 2016 or 2015, 2016 campaign. Martin, did you want to add anything? No, Christian said it. Great. You know, we're unfortunately running out of time. Maybe we'll just take one last question and, and you can add also any final comments on your parts. It's such an exciting conversation. I wish we can go on much longer. But we have uh, one final question from Arthur Landy who asks, do you think an aggressive libel law such as that which exists in England is a step toward removing the extensive lying and misinformation from the public domain. I think that's very dangerous. I think that laws, libel laws, or any of them can be used more. I mean, I don't want to say, keep saying the same thing and sound like the law and the ability to bring lawsuits is more or less in the hands of powerful people rather than less powerful people. Uh, you know, um, which is my concern about Smartmatics and the Dominion lawsuits. I think it's a very complicated question. I don't like the British system of law. I think it really can be used to punish truth telling too much. Uh, I like the concept of our model, but it has to be looked at again, given how money has taken over not only uh, the media, but elections and voting and everything else. Uh, so I think that that central issue, money and power, 
is made absolutely clear by Trump and many predecessors, the extent to which it deforms the most wonderful f sounding things in the law. Christian? Just say that, um, that uh, I'm looking very closely at a major case that's being brought against the Murdoch empire in Australia by a former Australian prime minister um, who will contend that the papers owned by Murdoch and the media owned by Murdoch in Australia has, has you know, really disrupted the public sphere. And you know, they talk about climate, they talk about all the issues that the Murdoch papers have campaigned against. And they're, they're calling for a royal commission. It's, it's like a, a blue ribbon panel to try to investigate um, the extent of that kind of power and how it's been used or misused. And so I'm looking very closely at that to see the result of that and whether it makes any, any changes at all. But as you know, Martin correctly talks about power and money, and I talk about politics all over the world in terms of what, what's happened to journalism all over the world, whether it's in the United States with Fox versus MSNBC, or whether it's in Egypt, you know, pro the military junta or pro some kind of democracy. Journalists are forced all over the world now into political corners. And it's become a really dangerous thing for journalists all over the world because they are at risk of at the least imprisonment or being shut down, at the worst, you know, being tortured or, or killed. And it's a very dangerous job to be a journalist these days. Around the world, I kid you not, being a journalist, well, the, the principal cause of death for journalists around the world is deliberate, i.e. They're, they're killed deliberately. That's obviously skewed from the general population where the principal cause of death is not murder. Um, and so this is very, very uh, difficult. And this has been a really interesting conversation, but many of us put our lives on the line to try to get the truth out. And I do hope that anybody listening tonight will really take this responsibility on their own shoulders as well until there's some kind of way to, to, to roll back the algorithms and to you know, reintroduce a sense of professionalism into a media that has been, or, or, or an institution, a professional institution that's been completely destroyed uh, by politics, no matter how, how hard we try. And many of us do and we succeed and many organizations do succeed, but we've, we've spent an hour talking about the dangers when they don't. Let me just say one last thing. It's impossible not to think of Khashoggi yeah. as we talk. It's impossible not to think of Trump's reaction to all that. And, 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 and that of course, as Christina goes on all over the world, but we saw it here and we saw the powerlessness of this country to resolve that horrific issue in this country that pays homage to the First Amendment. End of speech. And I will just make a PS. The truth won out in the end. It was hard, it wasn't pretty, but the truth won out in the end. Martin Garbus, Christiane Amanpour, I want to thank you both. I want to thank the entire audience for wonderful questions. This conversation, in my view, is the perfect way to mark the inaugural Kennedy Talks event. Thank you so much. We very much hope in the near future you can come visit us on campus. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Martin. Bye-bye, Edward. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.